page 40, Old MacDonald Had a Farm. At the top of the page they're introducing you to two new musical symbols that you need to know and learn and memorize forever and ever and ever and ever. But you're going to see them a lot. One is called a staccato and the other I need to talk about. The staccato is a dot. It can be above or below a note. Doesn't matter. It's not, that's not important. The point is it's a dot to a note. And it's not like a dot after the note. This dot has to be above or below the note. And it simply means you don't hold it out to its full length. You play it shorter. Now that doesn't mess up the beat. The beat's going to stay the same. So if I have this, just bear with me for a minute. Going to have some fun. Who knows? And I, I'm going to just a C position, and I do these notes. You already know that's legato. It's connected, legato. You know that. You know that. You're supposed to know that. Go back if you forgot. Go back and start the book again and go through it again. You're forgetting things, and you're not allowed to forget anything. No. That's legato. Remember, I also said way back then that there's two varieties connected, or you get disconnected. Disconnected is staccato. So you get legato or you get staccato. Take your pick. Staccato is where they're not connected. They could be really short staccatos. Or it could be longer staccatos. Or anywhere in between. That depends on what the music needs. It's called interpreting the music. You have to decide on a lot of these on how long your staccato is going to be. In the videos I usually tell you and most of the time it'll be short. We'll just short staccatos. You see the staccato dots all over everywhere? Mm -hmm. Okay. Then the other one I need to talk about. There's a lot of misunderstanding and disagreement on this including me. <laughs> but you might be reading something about it or talking to somebody about it and they might have other ideas and I need you to understand there's there's some variety going on with this line. Call it tenuto mark and that's fine. That's, there's no problem with what it's called. It's called a tenuto mark. How it's done is the problem. A long time ago, a couple hundred years ago and before, the tenuto mark was considered an accent. An accent is where you play the note a little louder than normal on piano. Now, the piano can't do a true accent. I won't get into that again. But the point is, you just play the note a little louder than normal. That's an accent. And this tenuto mark indicated that back then. Then as music evolved, the accent sign changed. And there are multiple accent signs. So this tenuto mark kind of evolved more into less of an accent and more of a linger or just hold on to the note as full value and if possible just a hair longer. You linger on that note. Well the act of lingering tends to put more stress on the note. You don't have to play it any louder. It's just you put more stress on the note. It's because there's sort of a difference between an accent and stress. Yeah. An accent, you play a little louder. It, a stress, you, you're stressing it just a hair. It's more like a felt thing, a natural accent, if you will. So, to new tone mark, they might consider that a stress mark in the sense of you're lingering on the note. You're not necessarily playing it louder. And I'll talk more about that a little later when we get into this piece. Now, speaking of the piece, let's talk about it. Let's look it over, make sure we got everything. Grand staff, naturally, they're always going to be a grand staff, so I'm not really going to be pointing that out anymore. It just know it's a grand staff. Treble and bass clef, I still need to point that out because it won't always be a treble and bass clef. It could change. So make sure you check the clef signs and treble and bass clef. Time signatures, common time, the C's for common, 4-4 four, four time. Same difference. Now we got quarter notes and dotted half notes and eighth notes. Look at the eighth notes and the third line down on Old MacDonald. You think, what is going on there? We'll get there. 
And the last line of this piece is at the top of page 41, because again it goes up there. Doesn't matter where the line is, you just keep playing until the piece is over. And the piece is over at that thin and thick bar line, you see, because that's the symbol for the end of a piece. Yeah. Now, again, both hands are involved, but we're just playing one hand at a time, so I'm going to talk about both hands. And we want to make sure we have the notes. Now, I'm assuming by now you know the names of these notes. If you don't, please drill yourself on it. You've got to learn the names of these notes. This should be instant. You don't have time to figure them out. So we're starting with right hand on thumb on middle C here. And the left hand, when it comes in, it's a fourth finger on a G here, which put it here, which you're in middle C position again. And I know they give you a chart telling you where to put your hands. But you won't always have those charts. I don't even like them. I need you to look at the music and figure out where the hands go based on looking at the music, because that's what you do forever. I mean, you always do that way. Now remember, common timer 4-4 four, four time, there's four counts in a measure, or a bar, same difference, and we're counting quarter notes. So, okay, here, quarter note gets count. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. One, two, three. Remember the dotted half note's the same as three quarter notes, or just yeah, memorize that. Doesn't matter what the time signature is. It's always the same as three quarter notes. Then second line at the end you got eighth notes. So it's one and two and. However, let's go down to the third line where we got lots of eighth notes. Oh goody. <laughs> so we're here. One and two. And I typically put the ands in before and after I need them. I don't wait until I need them to put them in. I, I'm getting my mental positioning, thoughts, whatever the word is, ready before I get to the eighth notes. So I would go one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. Now these, what's going on here? Okay. The right hand, they want second finger on C here. They want you to come down one. And they want the left hand second finger on the same note here. Well isn't that fun? I really don't know why. I see no reason for that. You can use thumbs as far as I'm concerned, but if you want to have some fun here and have your hands really get to know each other well, you can use second fingers. And the the eighth notes, even though they're in each staff, they can beam them together like they're doing here. So the first two eighth notes in that third measure on the third line, they're beamed together, but each note is in a different staff. They do that sometimes. Doesn't affect how you play it. It's still a one and two and thing. It's just now we're using the different hands on which note. So it's one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. And that's how that works. Then at the top of page 41 you go back to using thumb. So you th left hand then comes back down where it goes. If you're using second finger, you could actually use any finger. It's just the hands. When the hands get together in each other way, generally one hand will go under and one hand will go above. Like here, one hand above, I could use third finger. I wouldn't use fourth too much because that the point is you can use any finger you want and if, if you have to then one hand goes above and which hand goes above well there's certain guides you can use but in this case it doesn't matter whichever hand you want but since the left hand or the right hand plays the first one I'm gonna leave the right hand where it is and I'll make the left hand go above Although, when you do this, generally you'll lower the bottom hand and raise the upper hand so it's this way, a little bit. So they're out of each way. So this hand is lower, this way, and the other hand is going to be up above. I'll leave it up to you as to which hand is above or below. If you leave the thumbs on there, you don't have to. You can just, get, you can just leave it there and the thumbs can take turns. That solves the problem to me. So get the notes and the rhythms worked out where you can play the whole thing. 
and then we'll go back and add the articulation. Now they don't have any phrase markings in here. If there's words, and there are, you can follow the sentences in the words and that'll tell you where the phrases are. Sometimes you just play it and you can hear the phrase. Right there, there's, that's a phrase. It's like all the way to the dotted half notes, one phrase, and then the quarter note starts a new phrase. Well, lift up between the phrases. Even though there's no curved line, you can still put in the phrasing. So the last measure, the first line is here, lift up. So there's just a little silence as you're working the hands together. Again, phrase. So put in the phrasing. And the staccatos and tenutos, that's articulation also, and accents. So now we're going to play these staccato. Each note gets its own one, short staccato. I'm using a nice light hinging at the wrist here on both hands. Not real big, it's just a little one. Sometimes I exaggerate it so you can see it better in the camera, but it's really just a little one. I'm on the keys and I'm bouncing off if it's slow enough. Faster, you don't have time for that. You have to do that, but keep your hand close to the keys. Don't come way up and do that. Nuh uh. So here it's just. And that tenuto line, there for the half note, linger on it. Hang on to that full count and connect it to the next note. Connect this and this. I wouldn't put more stress on it because it messes up the phrasing, the shape of the phrase, a musical sentence. Generally we, we talk about shaping phrases in music. It's a little more advanced, but whatever. They're using two notes, I'll tell you. You come down usually at the end of a phrase. It's like at the end of a sentence you come down. It's just normal to come down. I mean you might go up, but typically you come down. Well in a musical sentence you come down too. Last two measures of the first line. So they would come down with a C. I wouldn't go. I couldn't play the last note louder than that, but that would be an accent if I did that. And so the tenuto, I wouldn't use it as a stress mark necessarily any more than you're just hanging on to it. Just hang on to it the full three counts and then go on. That's how I recommend you do the tenutos in this. Just hang on to them, linger on those notes total, the whole full length you can. Don't cut them short at all. You don't have to change the beat any. Keep the beat steady. But you just linger on the note as long as you can before you go on. So you go ahead and learn it. So you can play it at some steady beat. It can go slow. That's fine. You don't have to go as fast as I'm going. And when you're ready, when you have it, then come back and do the play with me. And let's check and make sure your notes and rhythms are correct. And I will do the articulation, the staccatos and all that. I will do that. And I'll do the phrasing too. So I'm going to give us four counts. So let's try it together very slowly. One, two, ready, go. Four. 